Given that this is dot scale, I thought I would attempt to see how many times I could say scale in 15 minutes, or 18 minutes, rather. Uh, I swear, I'm not trolling, except maybe a little bit. Um, so anyway, I'm Paul Dix, and this is my talk. At scale, everything is hard. So all of this is set within the context of InfluxDB. It's an open source time series database written in Go that we've been developing since 2013. So what do I mean when I talk about scale? Well, I'll tell you what I don't mean is I don't mean scaling the count of your servers. Scale is more about other things. It could be scaling your throughput, right, request per second. It could be scaling your total data size, how much data you're storing and looking at. But it could also be scaling your development teams, how many developers you have working on things. Scaling code bases in terms of lines of code, the amount of complexity that you have to deal with, and also scaling your products in terms of the number of features that you have and somehow keeping it tractable for your users and the people who, who have to figure everything out. And the thing is with all of these components, what I've learned at least over the last three years since my last talk here is at scale everything is hard. So my talk three years ago was this, time series data is the worst and best use case in distributed databases. And the high level like, arguments that I made for this were, one, it has very high read and write throughput, which sucks. Like You're both doing tons of writes and tons of reads. The reads consist of huge range scans over periods of data. You're like computing aggregates over windows of time across many, many series, which is a pain to deal with. One thing, thing that's actually nice about time series is it's largely an append, basically, adding data for now, or insert only in the case of historical backfill. So you don't have an update kind of workflow. But another thing that's weird is you, have, you frequently have deletes against large ranges of data. In time series, it's common for you to have high precision data that you keep around for a limited window of time, like say seven days, and then you want to evict it quickly to free up space. And then you have lower precision data that you keep around for longer periods. So that is an odd workload that you don't normally see within databases. And with time series, again, at scale, all of these things actually become hard. Before you hit scale, they're easy and you can use whatever kind of database you want to use. So part of this talk is, is our journey from InfluxDB 0.9, which was the version we were working on at the time I spoke at DotScale, and InfluxDB 2.0, which is what we're currently working on now. So over the course of this time, we're ma we've made a journey from a monolithic system to a services-based system. So I'll be talking a bit about that. But also, for our 2.0 architecture, we're basically trying to build a data platform that's based on containerization. So I said data platform and not database, even though it's InfluxDB. Uh, the thing is, like, storing and querying data is one part of what we do and what we want to accomplish, but there are other things like processing in the background, monitoring and alerting, scraping data sources. So there are a whole bunch of other things besides just the database itself, which is why I think talking about the architecture that we're creating is actually interesting and applicable to people in this audience, even though you might not be creating a database. Many of you are probably creating data platforms that have to deal with these problems. So flashback to 2015, this is what the InfluxDB website looked like when I gave my talk. Uh, as you can see, we were focused on trying to get 0 0.9 out the door. We'd been working on it for six months at this point. We said, yes, we're actually serious. It's coming. We're, we're not kidding you. Uh, anyway, since then, we've come a really long way. Uh, in that talk, I mentioned uh, we were thinking about doing a custom storage engine for time series specifically. Uh, at that time, we hadn't committed to that idea, and we hadn't written any code along those lines. So three months later, I actually got started and wrote the first little bit of code for what would become what is now our custom storage engine for time series data, the time-structured merge tree, 
And it looks very similar to like an LSM tree in, in the way it's built. Uh, as far as the storage format goes, it looks like a columnar database. So we have compression built in, but time is a first class citizen of the whole thing. In 2016, we released the 1.0 version of the open source project, and we also released a clustered version, which was our commercial offering. So the other thing, uh, before I get into the architecture of 2.0 that I want to talk about is, since we started the project, infrastructure software has advanced quite a bit, and it's changed. The whole landscape has kind of changed underneath us. We started Influx, the first commit was September 26th of 2013. It was the same year Docker got introduced, so we saw the rise of containerization, right? Obviously, containers existed beforehand, uh, but Docker is really what popularized the approach. Kubernetes is four years old now. Uh, I would say it's probably only been production worthy, maybe for like a year or two. Some of you may have been riding the edge and feeling pain on that. But the thing is, it's become the lingua franca for infrastructure, for working with cloud infrastructure, either on-prem or in one of the public clouds. And it's also, I think, really strengthened the concept of declarative in infrastructure, that is, infrastructure as code, which has kind of changed things about maybe how you would develop a data platform and a distributed system. So some of the lessons we've learned at scale over the last call it like four years. The first is uh, single tenancy. So we have like a cloud offering and it's basically a single tenanted service. So when somebody signs up, we provision new uh, EC2 instances and we set up a cluster and we have that running for them and we monitor it for them and all this other stuff. So we're running hundreds of clusters over thousands of Amazon instances. So operationally, this is like very, very painful to deal with because whenever we want to upgrade the platform, we actually have to upgrade, do hundreds of upgrades across it. And we have to monitor all of that stuff as well. And the other piece about this is that uh, the interesting part is customer usage kind of follows like a power law distribution, which is you know, the top 20% of, of the customers represent the vast majority of the usage. And actually, I would say, like, our top customer is probably, like, 50% of the overall throughput of the system. So what you have is you have hundreds of clusters that are running on hardware that's largely idle and a few that are actually basically at, like, 90 95%, which you never want to run your production setup at that, like, envelope because you have no room for error. So... One of the things that I think is interesting about Kubernetes and cluster schedulers in general is these are the kinds of problems that these, are, these systems are actually designed to solve. So at the same time, we scaled our team. We had 12 people in, in June of 2015 or somewhere around there. We have 90 people today. So collaboration that worked at a team of 12 completely breaks down at 90 people. And we're also a distributed team, so we ha we've had to address like how do we scale our team, developing, it, developing in all these code bases, uh, and make sure everybody's productive. So as I mentioned before, InfluxDB is a monolithic database. And actually, I think most databases right now, today, if not all that I know of anyway, are monolithic. They're a single code base. They're a single thing that runs. So at the time, Influx was 35,000 lines of code. Today, it represents about 280,000 lines of code. Now, of course, over the last three years, there's far more than that amount of code has been written because you do refactoring and replacement and all that other kind of stuff. Um, but the thing is, at scale, team scale now I'm talking about, not necessarily requests or data or whatever, but at team scale, monoliths are actually really, really hard. Um, I mean, the truth is I'm actually a fan of monoliths. I think in the early phases of a project, you're actually better served by creating a monolith because the biggest thing that you need to know is are you developing something that people want? So feature iteration speed is what's most important. And in a monolith, you don't have to think about inner, pro inner service RPC, all this other stuff. You just write your code, you deploy it. But when you get a really large team and a really large system, the monolith becomes a liability, particularly in terms of your velocity. The first problem is it creates a very, very large uh, surface area for your testing, right? If you have a new feature that you need to develop, you write your code, you put it into the code base, you have to run your entire test suite, right? 
unit tests, integration tests, performance, all that other stuff for the entire thing. So what that means is you actually get afraid to put code into the system. And you, like, I've seen our developers build up the scar tissue over time. Basically, they become afraid to develop new features because they don't know how it's going to affect other parts of the system because the whole thing's a monolith. And what you end up having is you have slower release cycles. And the problem with that is the slower your release cycle is, it's not like the developers are sitting idle and not doing anything. They're all writing a bunch of code. And the bigger your team is, the more code gets written. So if you have a release cycle that's every, say, six months, you're talking about a massive amount of code that gets dropped into a release. And the thing that I think is really counterintuitive is that the more frequently you release code, the less risky each release is. And actually, the easier it is to diagnose a problem when one occurs, because there's less code to dig through to find out what happened. So if you prefer this as like a tautology, it's uh, the more frequently you release code, the easier it is to release code. Or the easier it is to release code, the more frequently you will release code. So now talking about 2.0. I'm not talking about features or anything like this. What I want to talk about is uh, the, the design of the architecture of the thing. Uh, so when I thought about 2.0, I thought, what if I just started from scratch? I thought, what if I was building a data platform from scratch using the infrastructure tools that are available today? What would that thing look like? And also knowing that I had to have a large team that scaled out. Well, I'd want a database that's designed to be run in containers. Containers give you some nice properties. You can set resource limits, achieve isolation. I would design a database that's actually built around a set of services. So our database is actually kind of weird in that it's not an OLTP workload. So we can relax some of the constraints that you would see in OLTP and have an eventually consistent AP system that's built of a, comprised of a bunch of services. So we can parcel out these different pieces of functionality. So the whole thing is being built on top of Kubernetes. Kubernetes is basically the base layer of infrastructure uh, that we're building on. And it's designed from the ground up to be multi-tenanted, which again is something that we can do inside of Kubernetes that would be extremely hard within a monolithic database system. And like I said, like we can get workload isolation, not just across each individual service, potentially workload isolation across each tenant within the system. So roughly, this is what the architecture looks like. But before I get into that, let me just revisit the, the 2015 InfluxDB website. So when we launched, one of our early selling points was no external dependencies. And the reason I was excited about this at the time is because I saw what a dumpster fire Hadoop was, how hard it was to set up, how hard it was to use all these pieces. And I wanted something that was simple. Simple to use, simple to install, and simple to operate. And simple to operate at scale. And in fact, the fact that we have this complex architecture and the fact that we're building onto Kubernetes might be surprising. Last week, I wrote a blog post where I questioned whether or not Kubernetes was too complex for developers to use. Ultimately, I think there's some complexity there, but I think it will get better. And the truth is, it doesn't matter if it's complex to operate. And it doesn't matter for us if it's complex to develop as long as we can abstract that away from the users. Complex to operate is expected. Because at scale, everything is hard. The important thing is, for people who don't have to scale, for people who are running smaller systems, can we develop something that's actually easy to operate, easy to install, and easy to use? And my solution there is we release actual two separate things that support the same API. We have a single server monolith that gives you the full set of functionality. And then we have this complex SaaS looking cloud beast that's built on top of Kubernetes. So the different components. There's an API layer. Like I said, same API in this infrastructure as the thing that's developed in the monolith. There's a user interface. Again, looks exactly the same regardless of where you are. There's the storage tier, which is comprised of a write-ahead log, which is basically a write queue, a distributed write-ahead log. We're using Kafka right now for that. There are storage nodes, which are ostensibly they're a cache layer of both in-memory and on-disk on local SSD. Uh, then there's a consistent data store, which for us is just a key value store to store some sort of reference data. And finally, 
the canonical data store, which is just object storage that's cheap, where we can store huge amounts of data and not have to worry about it. There's the query processing tier. First, the API, which is the user's endpoint into it, and then any number of query processing containers that are able to run queries, they hit the storage, the storage nodes to get the data they need to execute a query. Then there's a tier for doing ETL, processing, monitoring, alerting, that kind of stuff. The API, there's a scheduler, which is basically an in-memory work queue, and there's a worker pool that pools off of, those, off of that work queue to execute that work. And finally, there's collection and scraping, which uses the same infrastructure as the processing and monitoring stuff. Now, the nice thing about this complicated setup is that we can deploy these services independently, and when you develop new code for them, you run your unit tests, you run your integration tests, but then you can do things like what we saw earlier today in the Istio demo. Canary builds, uh, blue-green deploys, all that kind of stuff. So within Kubernetes, one thing that's important, uh, I think a distinction that's important to pay attention to is stateless versus stateful services. Now, Stateless services is actually like where Kubernetes really shines. It's like it's bread and butter. These are things, this is you know, your application tier. These are you know, what you'd have in your standard like shared nothing architecture. These are things that can, can be spun up and they'll hit their data source, but you can kill those containers, scale them out, uh, auto scale, all that kind of stuff. Stateful services, which are these components, are things we have to worry about because they have data. Now, the object store and the consistent data store, for example, if we're in a cloud vendor, we can outsource that. We can put that outside our Kubernetes install. But for us, the write, the write log and the storage tier are actually stateful services that we operate inside Kubernetes. And we need to worry about how those move around within the infrastructure because data has gravity. It's not totally free to kill a, data, a stateful container and spin it up somewhere else and have it just come up. So, these are the components within the system that can auto-scale independently of each other, right? Each of these would be uh, their own thing. You can also represent the singleton pattern within Kubernetes, which is really nice. So for example, we have this task scheduler, which I mentioned is an in-memory queue. All the data for it is stored elsewhere. All we need to do is make sure that Kubernetes always makes sure one of them is running. If it's running, great. If it goes down, it loads the data it needs from the consistent store, and it's ready to go. And that's one of those things where, as we design the system, it doesn't need to be up like, it does, we don't need three of them to make sure it never goes down. As long as the startup time for it is fast enough, then we can have a few second hiccup and it's fine. So one of the first efforts that we did when we were doing the 2.0 stuff was we wanted to decouple compute or compute query compute from storage. So essentially, we created a new programming, a new language for the system, which originally we called IFQL. Uh, today I'm announcing that we're naming it Flux. Um, and Flux is a lightweight language for working with data. I don't call it a query language because it's more than that. Uh, so Flux is the language, but it's also the query engine. So the language is outside the scope of this talk. But the engine has things for, say, doing push-down processing. I mentioned we want to decouple query compute from storage, but it's not totally decoupled. You have the Flux processor, which gets a query. It pushes down some part of the query to the data nodes, which then sends summary ticks back up to the Flux processor, which then can combine them and send the results back up to the user. Uh, so one of the things we needed to do with this, and this is actually some of the work that I'm really excited about, uh, is we needed to optimize the RPC. In between this query processor and the storage nodes is a network connection, and we have to stream data across it, right? And the thing is, at scale, marshalling data is slow. It sucks. Even if you're using protobufs instead of JSON, it's still going to be slow. So the solution that we found for this is Apache Arrow. So Apache Arrow is a cross-language development platform for in-memory data. It specifies a standardized language-independent columnar format for flat and hierarchical data organized for efficient analytic operations on modern hardware. It also provides computational libraries and zero-copy streaming messaging and inter-process communication. 
Now, it's really nice to have this as a way to communicate between servers, because you can also hand that data off to other big data systems like Spark and all these other things. So zero copy means no marshalling overhead. We don't have to deal with that, which is a lot faster. In-memory columnar means we can do interesting things. We can take advantage of modern CPU architectures to get much, much better performance. So we actually started the initial Go implementation of Apache Arrow. An official one didn't exist when we started this work. Wes McKinney contacted us after he saw what we were doing, and we contributed this into the Apache Foundation. So that's where it lives now. Um, there's still a lot more work to do on this, but we have somebody who's actually working full time on this this month to improve this. But what you can see from the numbers there is the AVX optimized one is way faster than the pure Go one. And again, normally you wouldn't care about nanoseconds of improved performance, but the thing is, at scale, the data layout in memory matters because it costs, it costs time to move data from one place to another, even when you're in memory. And at scale, the CPU instruction set capabilities actually matter because they can improve your, form, your performance. So you can follow the Arrow development actually on the Apache Arrow uh, GitHub. They have a specific area for Go, the Go implementation. Uh, you can follow the development of Flux, the, the language, and the actual platform for that single server open source binary. Here, it's MIT licensed. That's the language, the engine, and that whole thing. So I have a saying when I'm talking to my team and we're working on some hard problem. <laughs> and the thing I say is, it wouldn't be any fun if it were easy. <laughs> so even though things at scale are hard, they're also interesting. Thank you.